talk to you about something that keeps me awake at night. And uh, it's a digital divide that we have in this country. And it's not the digital divide that you may be thinking of, you know, rich kids that have technology and poor kids that don't, although certainly I care about getting everybody access to technology. But there are natural market forces that are helping with that. Moore's law says that the cost of technology is coming down, uh, connectivity is becoming ubiquitous, and so that problem is largely making progress. But there's a more serious digital divide that we face in the country. And that is the divide between those who know how to use technology to reimagine learning and those who simply use technology to digitize traditional learning practices. When I was 14, I got this thing called a flatbed scanner. And it was kind of cool because you could take a picture like this. That's my little kiddo. You could put it on the flatbed scanner and it would turn that analog photograph into a digital photograph. Now, it didn't change the experience any. It's still a photograph. It was just a digital version of it. When I travel around the country and visit with schools, I see a similar thing happening with the way that we approach integrating technology. Maybe some of these examples will be familiar to you. We take a chalkboard and we digitize it. We take a textbook and we digitize it. We take a boring linear lecture <laughs> and we make digital boring linear lecture. <laughs> and my fear is that if we continue on this trajectory, very soon we will have successfully replicated in digital format exactly all of the traditional teaching methods that we use today. And I'm not sure that's what we want. And by the way, this is the reason I think people are still saying, does technology make a difference for learning? If you think about that, that's kind of a dumb question. It's kind of like saying, does paper make a difference for learning, right? So I think what we really need to be doing is asking a better question. When we take these goofy studies and we say, this group of kids is gonna go and use computers and learn, and this group of kids is gonna do the exact same thing, but they're gonna use t you know, books and paper to learn. And then we come back and go, there's no significant difference. Well, duh, any good study is gonna show that. Right? What we should be doing is saying, use technology to do entirely new things that simply were not possible before, and then measure that learning experience against the traditional model and see if there's a difference. That's a useful question to be asking. What I want to do is share three challenges that we face today in education across this country that I believe technology is uniquely suited to solve. First is this. We treat all learners the same, despite unique needs and challenges. We we'll walk into a classroom, we have a whole group of students, and they all have different needs and backgrounds and interests, and yet we treat them as if they're all the same. The least equitable thing we can do in learning is treat all students the same, because we know they need different things, and they know they have different interests. Just imagine for a second if we approach medicine this way. Say I went to the doctor and I said, you know, I'm not feeling really well. Can you help me out? And he said, sure, what day is it today? Uh, it's Thursday. Here you go, take the white pills. No, wait a minute, don't you want to ask what's wrong? No, it's Thursday, you get the white pills. What about the guy that was in here before me? What was wrong with him? Oh, he had a heart condition. Well, what would you give him? Well, the white pills, it's Thursday, right? That's crazy. And when we talk about it in medicine, it would outrage everybody, but yet that's what we do in hundreds and thousands of classrooms across the country every day. The second challenge is that we hold the schedule constant and allow the learning to vary. If I have a unit that I'm teaching in a week, by Wednesday, there's gonna be a whole bunch of students that already get it. They're ready to move on. But tough, they gotta to sit through to the end of the week. And when the end of the week comes, there's gonna be a group of students that still don't get it. But tough, we're moving on to learn something else that builds on what they didn't learn this week. I wonder how it's gonna go for them next week. Right, and so we put keeping the schedule constant over allowing people to learn even if the time needs to change. That should seem crazy to you. Challenge number three, performance data, AKA grades, come too late to be useful to the learner. By the time I get my end of semester results or the report card and I see that I fail the course, it's too late for me to do anything about it. The only thing that that serves is to make me feel bad, right? Why even do it? Why even have grades if that's gonna happen? So we need to think about how to change this. Now these three challenges, these are challenges that I believe we can solve if we're able to reimagine learning through technology. And I believe we can solve it by personalizing learning. Now let me talk about how technology can make this happen. Technology enables real-time feedback. It allows us to have maps that show exactly where the learner is going, where they're having trouble and how to get back on track, much like your GPS in your car. Imagine a learning positioning system that shows a learner where they're at, where they're going, and how to get back on track when they get off task. Technology allows us to adjust the pace. This is an example of a school in New York, 
called School of One, part of the iZone project. The students walk in every day and they see on these screens right here, their names, sort of listed like a, an airport when you see the flights, you know, but it has the kids' names and they see their name and they see where they're supposed to go to learn that day. And then they go like this group of girls right here and they learn whatever they're doing. And at the end of the period, they stop a few minutes early and they take a quick three question test. Doesn't affect their final grade, it's just to see how they did that day. That combined with the teacher's ratings of their performance and their homework goes into an algorithm that automatically regenerates the schedule customized to them for the next day. And they walk in the next day and they look up on the screen and they see what they're going to learn that day based on what they did the day before. Every student in that school learns to mastery, even though some may take a little longer in some areas than others. Technology gives learners agency. This is a school in Detroit the Detroit City Schools, the Michigan Achievement Authority, and they've done something similar. They also show progress uh, along the way, but they say, here's the task that you have to do. And this uh, screen that you have here shows multiple different activities that the learners can choose from and say, this is how I want to approach this activity. I want to watch this video or I want to do this activity with this other group of people. Now, that's neat to be able to give them that opportunity to choose because we know that students like to learn differently. Now, don't get that confused with learning styles, right? That's a bunch of malarkey. But this here is saying that students can make decisions about how they want to learn, and it may be different every day. Just because I choose to watch a video today doesn't mean I'm a video learner for the rest of my life, right? It means that that's the preference that I've chosen, and it's great to be able to give students choice. Technology creates creators. When students are given the tools of the pros, they can be put in the seat to be able to actually create stuff that's meaningful for them, that relates to things that they care about. If my kids are learning how to write, I want them to write using the tools that professional writers use. If my kids are learning to compose music, I want them to use the tools that professional musicians use. This is a school in Mooresville, North Carolina, some of you may have heard of. They've done a phenomenal job of this. They've gone in and they have these uh, uh, machines that the students can take, they actually can take home with them, and they go and they, and they do these great activities. And I went to visit Mooresville recently. There was something weird about it. I couldn't quite figure out what it was. First I thought, you know, it's because there's laptops everywhere. But I've been in other schools where there's lots of laptops, and I thought that's not it. It was about the fifth classroom I walked into, it suddenly hit me. I couldn't tell where the front of the room was. And all of the rooms that I'd been in, I couldn't tell where the front of the room was because all the students were sitting there working collaboratively on these projects that they were creating. It was a really neat experience. And by the way, Mooresville has seen a decrease in 64% of out-of-school suspensions, dropout rate cut in half, and the college rate increased by 12% after implementing this, after reimagining learning. That's amazing. And that's not a blip, that's sustained after they made the switch to reimagine learning. Very powerful stuff. Technology enables mass customization. This is an example from Arizona State University. And they said, we're gonna reimagine the way we deal with students that are coming in that are not prepared to take basic math at the college level. Sometimes we call those remedial math courses. And they came in and they said, we're going to use this tool that's going to collect as much data as we possibly can. We call that learning analytics or big data. And we're talking to the tune of hundreds of thousands of data points per student. So I was talking to him. I said, give me an example of what you do with 100,000 data points. He said, well, here's one example. We can tell that Richard should never get a new concept presented to him before 11 o'clock in the morning. And we can tell that you should never get one before you know, four o'clock in the afternoon because we know that that's not how you learn. And if you get something really early in the morning, it's gonna just be a blur to me, and that's true. Now, I said, that's interesting, what else? And they said, well, see this question here? This is a quiz, and it shows that you got the right answer. I said, yeah. They said, but here's what we do. We measure where you have the mouse and how long you hovered over the wrong answer before you click the right one. And we see that you hovered over the wrong answer for 15 seconds, which means you actually got it down to two and made a 50-50 guess and got it right. That's very different than the question before, where you click the right answer in two seconds right off the bat. And so we know that you don't have that concept as solidly, even though it shows that you got it right on the test. That's pretty amazing, and that's the power of using technology to reimagine learning. One more example. Because there are thousands of students going through this, there are natural patterns that are occurring. Right? And so if there's a student that comes along and I get stuck right at a certain point, by sheer dumb luck, there are thousands of other students behind me that followed my same path and got stuck right at the same point. And guess what? They all found a way to move on. And so the system can say, it's a pretty high chance that all of these other students that followed your same path and got stuck right here went and talked to this teacher and were able to move on. That's probably what you should do. That's really cool. The pass rate of that course, since they implemented this, increased by 10%. And this is the really powerful point. 45% of the students finished more than a month early. Very, very powerful when we use data. Now, 
the OECD says that by 2025, 263 million students around the world will be ready to enter college. Now, just to put that in perspective, if we were to use our traditional approach of building buildings to try to meet that need, we would have to build four universities the size of UMass Amherst every week for the next 15 years. Now, I'm a glasses half full kind of guy. I don't know about you, I just don't really see that happening. <laughs> Technology has the ability to radically improve access. These are examples of MOOCs, massive open online courses. This whole idea started by this guy right here, Sebastian Thrun, who's a faculty member at Stanford. Really cool guy, in fact, arguably one of the best teachers in the world on artificial intelligence. Everybody wanted to get into his classes, but because of that, nobody could get into his classes. And that created a problem, and so Sebastian, he knew how to use technology to reimagine learning, not just digitize traditional processes. And he said, I'm gonna move this course online and open it up to everybody. Anybody who wants to can come in and take it. By the end of the semester, he had 160,000 students taking his course. Yeah, so if he continued teaching every semester, right, his normal course, every semester running that same course, it would take him 400 years to serve that many students, right? And so amazingly powerful when we're able to leverage technology to meet these needs. But it brings me back to my original point, which is that we can only do that if we're able to bridge this divide because we're not going to get there if we simply continue to digitize traditional models. And so we have to close this gap. We have to find ways to shatter the status quo of learning through technology. And there's some things that we're doing at the Department of Education to try to make that happen. This is a report that we have called Learning Powered by Technology. It's a national education technology plan that's out there for any teacher, school, or organization to look at as a guide for how we can use technology to reimagine learning. And there's a whole bunch of initiatives that we're putting behind this as well. Race to the Top District is a program that gives just under $500 million to districts around the country to, in, to implement personalized learning. Data Palooza is an event that we just recently ran at the White House, where we said, look, if we're gonna use all of these new data-driven personalized tools, we gotta have people building these tools. So we went out and found the best developers we could find and invited them in and we challenged them. We said, you need to build tools that will help our students make better decisions. And in 90 days, they came up with some phenomenal stuff, tools to help students know exactly how much they will really pay for college, because it's hard to tell by looking at the sticker price what you actually pay. Tools that help parents manage all of the data on a student who has an individualized education plan, or IEP. Phenomenal tools that came out of that. The Learning Registry, a project where we're going and saying, can we collect data about all of the best learning content in the world, all of it? and then make it available for people to build tools on top of that can recommend the right content to the right teacher or student for exactly what they need and when they need it. Powerful stuff happening. That said, I've been in education a while, and I know that change is hard, and reimagining things can be difficult. And so sometimes when we get into a position where we get stuck, where we get in mired in uh, somebody who may be concerned about how, how to move forward with technology, it's useful to look at it from a different lens. This is one of my favorite examples. It's called Pencil Chat. And these were some teachers who came together and they basically said, we're going to use Twitter and we're gonna take statements that people make about reimagining learning through technology, but instead of having the technology, we're gonna swap it out for the word pencil. And here's what we have, some examples. If we give every student a pencil, we will have no control over the things they write. <laughs> I like this one. Why should we give students pencils when they're in school? They can just wait until they get a job and get one then. And here's my favorite. What happens if a pencil breaks in the middle of my class? How am I expected to deal with such a disruption? <laughs> and so when we look at it like that, we see how ridiculous it is. And that's helpful to have us bridge this gap. Now, we need your help to do this. Educators, help by shifting from digitizing traditional processes to thinking about how to completely reinvent learning through technology. Developers, we need you to build awesome tools. We have phenomenal teachers across the country that are trying to do this, but it's hard. And we need you to build the right tools to make it easier for them and to make this possible for everybody. And students and parents, we need, we need you to express the urgency of this to your schools, that they leverage personalized learning to improve education. There are a lot of challenges that we face in education today, but we have the tools right now to solve all of them. We have the tools right now to solve all of the educational challenges if we can find a way to divide this gap, if we can find a way to close it. And we have to do it now and we have to do it fast because our students deserve it and they can't afford to wait any longer. Thank you.